This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 354, recorded on September 11th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Good morning. Good afternoon, Dixon. It's good afternoon, and it is a good afternoon. 2 p.m. Yep. It is 24 Celsius. <laughs> right. <laughs> with a few clouds. It's uh, sunny more than out. a few clouds. I would say half of the sky is cloudy. I would say half of the sky is clear. <laughs> and we would both be right. You know, uh, it's been a few days of rain after in August yeah, with no rain. so right. Much appreciated rain, actually. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you? Doing okay. It's um, about the same here. It's uh, uh, partly cloudy, partly sunny, depending on your perspective or... Um, <laughs> Or if you're the Aviation Weather Center, you would say scattered clouds. At, scattered. Uh, right. feet. Who scattered them, Alan? I, I don't know. <laughs> they, they scatter themselves. <laughs> Ten miles visibility. They were solid clouds when I woke up. It was really crummy. Oh. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hi, it's Welcome. 66. Uh, thank you. It's 66 Fahrenheit, 57. No, uh, that's going to be low tonight, 57. I don't know the Celsius because I'm not on that app. But uh, uh, there it is, 17 Celsius. And uh, chilly, chilly. when I looked at my iPhone and said it raining, was raining, I had to stand up and see that indeed it's it raining, is. Yeah. Light dark. rain. Light. Yeah. It's a little chilly there, huh? Yeah, but it's our first rain in a long time, I think, during the day. So really it's okay. Yeah. It's just that every year when we have our microbiology departmental picnic, it's on a Friday. <laughs> and rains. it's the coolest <laughs> weather and the rainiest weather for, you know, again, like yesterday was sunny, tomorrow's going to be sunny, and just Today you jinxed. had your picnic? Yep. <laughs> uh, it was short, I guess. It's tonight. It's, oh, it's, a, it's oh, not tonight. Might it's we have to reschedule yeah. this next yeah. year. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it's on different Fridays oh, that's in bizarre. the fall every year. It just Yeah, just happens. Also joining us from Austin, <laughs> Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. The How one, are you? The wandering Which, virologist. That's right. Yeah, the itinerant, uh, what was it? Emeritus. Itinerant, <laughs> emeritus, <laughs> freelance right. virologist. Right. There you go. What does so. emeritus mean to you, Rich? Yeah. Oh, you're going to uh, tell us. Right? You're, you're going to tell you, but first, but first I got to tell you that it's uh, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, 31 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, cool, relative to the rest of the week that I have spent here, and uh, overcast. We've hey, had a little rain recently. You went to visit our friend Neva, right? I did. I did. It was great. It was fantastic. I, uh, I contacted her, and we met up for lunch at Central Market, which is sort of, um, well, it's one of the local, it's the, it's the sort of, big box version of the local chain store. It's really a great place. It's wonderful. And we had a very nice conversation, got to know each other. I would like to uh, uh, get to know Neva even better, spend some more time with her. She is a longtime Twix, Twix fan. Oh, not just Twix. Twiv, she listens to Oh, no, she listens to everything. Oh, nice. My. She very listens good. to everything. And what, yep. what, is, what's, what did she do in her lifetime, did she tell you? Um, lots of different things. She worked for the airline industry for a while. Mm -hmm. I didn't get into detail on that capacity. Uh, over the last uh, few decades, uh, if I understood it correctly, she's um, had a, uh, a partnership in a, a, a cabinetry shop mm -hmm. oh. that she just kind of fell into. Could you give us some uh, background here? Why were you seeing her for lunch? Well, Dixon, uh, what's if the you, connection? If you had listened okay. to Twiv for the last eight years, you would know. <laughs> Actually, what do you mean? You listen? Know, <laughs> you know, the seventh anniversary of Twiv is coming up. Uh -huh. Wow! Is it the really? first broadcast was in two thousand eight, wow. mm -hmm. September twenty fourth? Wow! I'll be curious wow. to see how much my voice has day. changed. <laughs> At any rate, yeah. uh, Neva uh, Neva wrote us very early on. Uh, in this whole thing. And she was from Buda, Texas. And Buda, Texas, oh. at the time, 
uh, my daughter and her family had not even moved inside the Austin city limits. They were living in Kyle, which is a little south of here and right next door to Buda. So I was one of the few people on the planet who knew what Buda was or how to pronounce it. We had a story arc for a while on how to pronounce Buda because some people <laughs> want to pronounce it Buddha. So I was, you know, just very entertained that we had a listener uh, nice. from Buda, Texas. And uh, she's uh, written in some really nice observations and some nice questions. And so I've always uh, been interested cool. in meeting her. And now I had a chance this time. It's great. So, Dixon, not only you don't know who Debbie Harry is, you don't know who Neva is. <laughs> I know Blondie. <laughs> we even have Buda as a show title, as I recall. Huh. Yes. Stump, stump grinding. Uh, Buda to stump grinding or something like that. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay. All right. So. This episode is sponsored by ASM Gap, and they would like you to know about a three-month, six-part program, a webinar series on scientific writing and publishing. It's going to start in January 2016 and go on through March, and the, the purpose of this is to teach you how to write better papers. You're going to learn from ASM journal editors about the whole process of writing and publishing, you will learn how to write great titles, great abstracts, how to put the figures and legends together, how the review process works, which journal you should submit to, etc. And uh, this is going to be done as a webinar, so you can sit in the comfort of your home and do all of this. And you need to apply to uh, be admitted to this. The deadline is December 1st. And you can apply at the website bit.ly slash SWPI online 15. That's all one word. So a three-month, six-part series application December 1st. You should check it out. I think it could be a useful thing for many people because the publishing uh, business changes. And what happened 10 years ago, Dixon, is not what happens today. That's very true. You know, we, used to, we used to type up our manuscripts. Oh, and it a was typewriter. Painful, painful with with copies uh, with um, you know blue pieces of carbon paper in between. It and was we used to send painful. three copies off to the journal. Painful. When I was an editor and I handled reviews, <clears throat> I had to send a copy to each of the reviewers. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes they didn't want to review it, so they would mail it right. back, <laughs> and then you <laughs> exactly. had to mail it to someone else. Uh, yeah, that right. At, at least you didn't have to set the type like I did, because that's how old I am. <laughs> Me and Gutenberg were just like that. I yeah, know you look. You look at Dixon. You look at. I feel it. All right. So that is the ASM Gap Scientific Writing and Publishing Webinar Series. We thank ASM for their support of TWIV. Now we have a bunch of follow up, beginning with some character named Rich. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Hmm. Did you listen hmm. to last week's episode, Rich? I did. It's pretty cool that C, C. Gamp is in virus particles, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed it is. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> I just received a, There's a write-up in Science this week uh, about those papers that uh, Ed Niles just uh, sent me. Hmm. Um, so, at any rate, this made me think about an old, old paper uh, on vaccinia virus from 1987, because there's always been a question as to what the virus could package in the virions and how much of what you see is there, shall we say, deliberately, mm -hmm. uh, or just along for the ride, what we actually now call the hitchhiker um, function or whatever. And so this is a, there's a, a study done and published in 1987 by Dennis Ruby, who we've interviewed on uh, Twiv and uh, Chris Frankie uh, called Association of Nonviral Proteins uh, with Recombinant Vaccinia Virus Virions. He asked, they asked this question, and the way they did it <clears throat> was to clone into Vaccinia a copy of the bacterial enzyme chloramphenicol acyl transferase, or CAT, which is a reporter enzyme. It has an enzymatic activity that has no background in eukaryotic cells, uh, and so it makes for a very sensitive uh, assay. So they cloned this thing into the, into the virus genome and infected cells uh, with that virus and then purified virus from the infected cells, and uh, by enzymatic assay uh, looked to see whether the enzyme was packaged into the virions, and indeed it was. As a matter of fact, they could even go a step further. As Dixon pointed out last time, this is an enveloped virus, and Dixon very astutely pointed out <laughs> that uh, things could ride along 
uh, in between the envelope and the core, which I think is true. They could probably write along a lot of different places. But there's always uh, issues that come up as to whether or not your prep is purified enough. And one of the things that you can do with this that I believe they did in this paper is take the purified virus and then strip off the envelope and isolate the cores, uh -huh. which is... Uh, a way at getting at, I think, a purer preparation and also asking where this thing is. And if I'm not mistaken, they found this uh, actually in the cores. Now, you could criticize this by saying it's a very sensitive assay, so you don't really know how much you're looking at. But I've always kept it in mind, uh, as I think viruses can indeed uh, package things sort of willy-nilly. That's not to say that it's not without consequence. So, Rich, uh, if you were or, doing this experiment today, would you do anything different to rule out uh, your uh, your caveat for this being such a sensitive assay? Uh, so, I would, uh, if I were doing it today and I had a whole bucket of money, yeah, uh, I would do things like super resolution microscopy there to see go. if I could localize it within the virion, and I would do some degradation as well, and I would try and do some sort of quantitative assay to figure out. Uh, how much was there in even a molar amount, okay? Right. Uh, how, how many per virion? Who's boiling water? Someone's <laughs> tea is done. I'm, so uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're making tea? Uh, my wife is making oh, tea, that's okay? okay. She know, can have her tea. It's okay. Chill out. She can have her tea. That's <laughs> right. is exactly right. As long as it's where you are, it's got to be iced tea, though, right? Uh, no. no. It's regular old tea. It's oh, okay. okay. All right. So you'd use a, uh, another marker. What about doing two different proteins to make sure that they both co-localize? Uh, like fluorescent green, for instance. You could do that, yeah. As a matter of fact, a, uh, a GFP, actually, yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. GFP just by itself yeah, be would be a, a great thing to do. Sure. And you could do GFP and RFP and Look see what you. happens. As a matter Look of fact... Yeah, a matter of fact, I think there there are viruses around that express both those things. You could do this experiment tomorrow. You don't need to call one of, of my buddies, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get on it, Rich. <laughs> exactly. What are you doing so, there? So, Rich, the implication is it's just pulling stuff out of the cell, right? Yeah. Because cat shouldn't be there. It has no wow. signal to getting. Uh, absolutely. Right? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. But the okay. it, but there are probably I'm sure there are many viral proteins in there that get specifically incorporated, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the question is tr is trying to uh, so things that shouldn't be there are there, uh, you know whether how relevant that is. I, I mean it's yeah, it's right. a factlet that you have to keep in mind with this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And and so uh, and uh, lots of times when people do proteomic analysis on vaccinia or other, in particular vaccinia, but other um, viruses as well. They find a bunch of host proteins. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, if you compare one proteomic analysis with another one, you find that the, the greatest variation in content is with the um, host proteins. So the one way to figure out what's there quote, deliberately, unquote, and what's yeah. not, I suppose, is yeah. to compare the proteomic analysis from a bunch of different uh, papers and see right. what shows up all the time. Sure. So, so the, fact, the we vaccinia gotta, virus we, vaccine, vaccine now, uh, is a, mm -hmm. it's an attenuated virus vaccine, yes? Uh, I would call it, uh, I refer to it as naturally attenuated okay. from the point of view that it's a, a pox virus originally isolated from a natural source that's uh, related to smallpox, so you get cross-reactivity, so but uh, attenuated. What cell lines did they use to make that? Uh, well, <laughs> originally, uh, it was grown, actually, originally, uh, that was isolated from cattle right. and passaged in the arms of humans <laughs> until they figured out that they could passage it on cattle. Were the arms attached to humans when they passaged uh -huh. it? <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> no, they transferred them to cows. <laughs> so then it was passaged on cattle for a long time, and even the old uh, Wyeth vaccine, Drivax, was made by giving calves essentially a confluent vaccination yeah. And scraping off uh, the material from all these big, this con huge yeah, confluent so pussy legion. Scarification, basically. Yeah, okay. scarification. Got it. And it's only uh, in the second and third generation vaccines that are being manufactured now that they are making them in cells. And yes. I believe the MVA vaccine is made in chick embryo fibroblasts, though I'm not sure about that. 
So my question I, would be, is there a possibility when you got the vaccine that you could become hypersensitive to a protein that you later on, you know, like some food product, like chick embryo, uh, chicken eggs, chicken yolk, something that could elicit uh, an unintended consequence? I suppose there, that possibility exists. In fact, with the older vaccines, the, actually, the problem with the human arm-to-arm vaccine was that uh, you could transfer other diseases from humans right. to humans, uh, notably, sure. notably syphilis. Sure. And so that sure. practice, once they figured out they could do it in calves, that practice was actually outlawed. Right. Uh, then you still have problems with the uh, uh, vaccine made in calves of yeah. things like bacterial ca- uh, contamination. They usually drop in a little phenol to um, right. try and inactivate the bacteria. So there are much worse problems than hypersensitivity. Yeah, in fact, sure, I don't sure. I don't know of any reports of uh, hypersensitivity, but okay. in theory, I suppose uh, it could happen. Okay, Rich, uh, you are an emeritus professor. Uh, that's correct. What, I am a newly minted emeritus professor. <laughs> what does it mean? Uh, I, I noted this uh, conversation that you guys had last time, and I want to just uh, provide my spin on it. From what I'm hearing, I think that this really varies widely by individual and by institution. So I will tell you my case. I actually requested to become an emeritus professor primarily so that I could do TWIV. Really? Nice. And what that and means? They laughed. That, I presume the, they the, laughed. <laughs> uh, the the connection there is that as an emeritus professor, I retain my faculty status, so I have access to the library. Got it. Yeah. yeah which for me, for right. me means the VPN connection, yeah. and without that, I'm closed out of I'm 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 closed out of the paywall. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that to me was the most important thing. You uh, along your with that, faculty status. Huh? Essentially, yeah. They didn't Along promise with, you an office or a space that you could sit in? Uh, I could have had an office, but I declined. Okay, but that's not I, an option here. So that's a big difference. Yeah, well, like I said, it varies. Yeah. It varies from yeah, place Dixon, to place. Get lost. The other thing I got, Again? the other thing I get with this is I retain my email address. Yeah. I don't really care all that much about that, but it does keep me on some list serves, right. some of sure. which are interesting. Actually, the, the most interesting thing about that is that I take great glee in deleting a bunch of stuff uh, <laughs> that otherwise would have been a bother. Okay. Right. right. Faculty the meeting third, notices, yeah. And of course they maintain you at full salary. Uh, <laughs> not. Uh, not. And um, uh, also I get uh, free parking. Oh, nice. Free in perpetuity. Parking. No, that's a Free big parking that's in a perpetuity. Big that's a big hey, uh, Dixon, Not that I'll use it should we much. review what the canned <laughs> president of uh, United Airlines gets? <laughs> <laughs> review it. You'll, you'll be sick when you hear yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah I don't want to know. Yeah, well. Hmm. And I wanted to add that I'm finding that although <clears throat> I've never been all that interested in what Feynman would call epaulets, mm-hmm. that is, you know, uh, 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 honoraria yeah. that you know just are names and that kind of stuff I must say that if I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest after dedicating uh, most of my life to being a professor I'd kind of like to still be able to call myself a <laughs> yes. professor here, here. you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so why not here, here. there you go that's okay. my two cents yeah so I would like to be an emeritus when I basically stop working yeah, that's- all right if I stop, who knows? Yep. Yeah, but they won't give you an office. That's it. No, they won't. Or free parking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they well, might. You know, if Columbia gave you free parking, you could sublet it for a small support. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if you had an office, yeah. you could do even better than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they would. They would give me an office if I paid for it. It's like eighty dollars a square foot. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, Rich, did you have free parking when you were working there? No. You had to pay. No. Okay. I had to pay, and it, See, I suppose by New York standards, it was. I forget what it was. My, it was, my by New York standards, is, it wasn't all. Yeah. Dixon, don't talk over it, him. Okay, I'm, I'm it's sorry. okay. Let I, Dixon talk. What <laughs> I what I wanted them to say to me, which they never did, of course, was, we appreciate the fact that you were here for so many years and you dedicated your life to whatever you thought was important to better humanity by teaching parasitic diseases to the medical students, and as a resort, and as a resort, <laughs> as a result. And as a reward for being such a good citizen of this university community, we give you free access to all of the clubs. And so there's one faculty club downtown, and there's a faculty club uptown with unlimited meals for yourself, for yourself, not for anybody else. But you can eat there anytime you want, 
and and we'll pick up the tab. Is that what matters, food? Well, it would have been nice for them to offer something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, access to the library is great. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, but they, now they've sent all the books away, so it's all electronic, and it's not really a library Can you still get uh, journals, Dixon? I can still get them. You lock electronically. Can you download papers? Oh, sure. No, I have, I have full email capacity. So here, if you so. were not emeritus, would you not be able to download I don't know the papers? answer. I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Because that in itself is really a no, good That's a good benefit. question. Right. Huh? That to me was the number one number but I'll, one priority. I'll tell you something. If I'm at home, uh, my email address, just because it's a Columbia email address, does not allow me to download the literature. If I'm here and I use it, I get it. Well, you can. You just have to go through a different portal. I'm a different server. But I'm not showing you how to do it. Because <laughs> every week you'll be asking me how to do it. I Well, maybe. All right. Thank you, Rich. That was good. Sure. We have a couple of follow-up emails. One is from Peter, who writes, Dear TWIV team, regarding Stephen's letter to TWIV 353 about possible lab leaks caused by damage to buildings. There was a foot-and-mouth outbreak in the UK in 2007 due to contamination from a research lab. This was right. not a result of damage to the buildings, but rather a bureaucratic dispute over which of two labs on site had responsibility to pay for maintenance of the aging drainage system. Oh, the health and safety executive concluded that heavy rain had overloaded the leaking drains, washing muddy effluent into the ground where it contaminated vehicle tires, T-Y-R-E-S, lovely, <laughs> which spread it to the road where it contaminated farm vehicles. My, my. And he, he gives two links to this well-known outbreak. Yes. Which was very sad because they had to call lots and lots of cattle to uh, contain it. Yeah. Actually, the T-Y-R-E-S <laughs> were on lorries. That's right. Yeah, just to complete the <laughs> That's picture. Right. That's right. That's right. So this, um, the moral of the story is gain-of-function moratoria is not <laughs> what you need to do. You need to pay for your plumbing up. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Vincent, Unbelievable. have you ever been to the Purbright? Because I have. I haven't been, no. Yeah, I got to visit there in 1981. Was it mm. quaint? It was quaint. They were playing <laughs> soccer in an inner courtyard that the ground surface was rocks Oof. <laughs> <laughs> i just Oof. but that's what they could do without having to you know decontaminate themselves and you know go back out Ugh. so yeah uh these, these articles were very interesting and, and and part of them uh i noticed there were two potential sources of this strain of foot and mouth disease virus that got out that were being worked on at per right at the time uh one was some experimental work that involved very uh, small amounts and they can't say conclusively which uh, source it was, but mm. uh, the other was a vaccine preparation that was be being done by a vaccine company that involved 12,000 liters of foot and mouth disease. That would be my bet. <laughs> that would be <laughs> my bet. All right, Alan, can you take the next one? <laughs> sure. Fernando writes, Missing Alan Repartee. Hi, Twiv Talkers. Yes, some issues you sound like a virus-themed car talk rebirth. When Dixon gave his pick as the PhD movie and the postdoc sequel was mentioned, Alan unaccountably failed to note that it would be not that it would not be a sequel, but a whole series, postdoc N for N from one to infinity. <laughs> yes, yes, well put, Fernando. Uh -huh. Kathy, you have a follow-up. Right, Kathy writes, Jonathan Colton <laughs> did a thing a week for a year. So it wasn't a thing a day as uh, right. Vincent Oh, it was thought. a thing a week, okay. It's a thing a week. And he wrote songs, covered songs, and so forth. And it's part of what uh, made him uh, rise to public knowledge was that he was doing this thing a week. So. Yep, John. I, I, my favorite is Code Monkey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's what, that's what really brought him to a lot yeah. of people's attention. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe, I'm sure Dixon doesn't know this, and maybe none of you do. Absolutely sure I do. But he subsequently wrote the closing song for a computer game called Portal. You're right. Oh. I didn't know that. Um, and it's really, really very good. And so there are two versions, one that he sings and one that is sung by supposedly the computer in the story in the game which was actually an opera singer who sang it, and then they kind of altered her voice to make her sound computerish. Hmm. And it begins with, this was a triumph. The computer is just put to sleep, and she's singing it. It's really good, really very, very good. At the end of the game, when you win, and I saw this because my kids won the game, uh, there's the, the credits scroll in a, in a uh, green text on a black background, right? Mm -hmm. Which Dixon, you don't get that, right? 
Not at all. Okay. <laughs> and then they play this theme song, which is, I think it's his second best song. Is Do you know that one, Kathy? I uh, don't know that one, but portal, I know portal, a lot of his other ones. Portal theme song. Yeah, very so, good. And I must say, there's a, there's a podcast I listen to called ATP. High energy. To, oh, high energy. High energy. has nothing to do with energy. <laughs> or tennis. It's called the Accidental Tech Podcast. And uh, Colton wrote them a theme song. Damn it. <laughs> there you go. Well, did you ask him to write one? No, I didn't. Well, it's too late now anyway. I mean, there's too much identification with the current theme. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> but he didn't write us one. I guess he doesn't listen. All right. Anyway, we have some snippets. Uh, I wanted to bring... I, so I, I follow uh, Rebecca Sklute on Instagram. And she posted something this week. Which was a story, which is just so silly. A woman from a mother in Knoxville, Texas. Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee. Sorry, isn't there a Knoxville, Texas too? No, it's just Tennessee. Believes that uh, her book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, is pornographic. Because uh, she talks about cervical cells and uh, promiscuity. Really? And the word cervix in particular bothered her, yeah. So My she's goodness. asking the school not to let them read it. Because, you know, lots of schools uh, assign this for reading to... Uh, to kids, high schools, and uh, Rebecca was just flabbergasted, of course. So I just thought, uh, is, I'm, I'm surprised this, I'm not surprised, right? Don't be surprised. The Crazy. thing that, uh, disappointed. So, <laughs> so this particular mother's son got to read some alternative book. My first thought was, this will sell more books. Yes. Right. Yeah, it will. Good. But, sure. Good. Um, it's it's not pornographic, right? Why? No, of course not. Of course why would not. you? Why would this mother be so off? Because the they table? don't understand uh, the word pornography. The, ama- the what, amazing which part thing. of Tennessee didn't you understand? I'll tell you what pornography. <laughs> yeah, I guess is. that's. It. I mean, right. sorry, but it's. Um, yeah. If the kid's fifteen years old, and I'm thinking exactly every fifteen year old I know is way beyond that, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Anyway, sorry about that, Rebecca, but. Um, wanted to mention it. Thad sent in a link to an article. He wrote, this topic might make an interesting topic of discussion on TWIV. And it is a article. He sends an Al Jazeera story. There's also, uh, this has been covered widely in the press. In fact, I got a call yesterday from a Washington Post reporter and he said, you know, people are really scared about this new virus. Could you uh, comment on it? <laughs> so it's from our friends in France, uh, Chantal Abergel and Jean-Michel Clavery who are experts at identifying huge viruses from the environment, Mimi viruses and Pandora viruses and Pithovirus, and this is another uh, isolate. You may remember we talked about um, the isolation of Pithovirus sibiricum from uh, Siberian permafrost. They got their hands on a ice core, which was dated at about 30,000 years ago, and from this, you know, they they got a little piece of this ice. I guess these cores are really long, right? And they got a piece of the ice and they thawed it and they added it to acanthamoeba castellani cultures in the lab and outgrew a Pithovirus sibiricum. Really right, big. so those cultures are an amoeba. Amoeba. Okay? Yes. Amoeba. That's what these things grow on. Amoeba. Or in. <laughs> Although, you know, um, what's the natural host? I don't know. But they do grow on amoeba. Right. Anyway, they went back to the same uh, sample from the same core and did it again and isolated a different virus, and that's the subject of this paper, 30,000-year-old virus. They call it Molivirus sibiricum, and again, it infects acanthamoeba. And at the very end of the article, they say that, you know, as the... uh, as the ice in the world melts and we explore more and more, <laughs> who knows if uh, distant viruses of ancient Siberian human or animal population would reemerge. And the press picked up on that, and they call this the Franken virus. <laughs> and, I don't know how this got named Franken virus. Exactly. <laughs> Where does that come from? I know that that prefix gets attached to a lot of things that but there there's usually it's in the context of something being human modified and you know the whole frankenstein yeah, right uh, that's right mary shelley concept right. of uh, tampering with what god hath wrought and all that but exactly. um this has nothing to do with that no no it's not no. it's not modified or anything it's no. just it's out there and yes. they found it and okay they look and it grows it. on amoeba it grows an amoeba, and and 
they looked in an interesting place and did a new type of assay that other people hadn't done with those samples, and they found something new, which is cool and deserves a and publication. They did a very, the paper is very nice. They did they, a nice, they job, did a nice job of it, and yeah. and it's an interesting thing to study. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> It's interesting. The reporter got quotes from Vincent, from yes. Tony Fauci, Tony Fauci, from Grant McFadden, <laughs> yes. and uh, Tara Smith from yes. Kent State. So that's mm -hmm. great. He did a good job, and uh, of course the authors. He also spoke with um, the, the fella. What's his name here? Jean Michel. Mm -hmm. I said you should speak to Chantal, but she was away. So this is a big virus, but not as big as some of the others. 651 kilobase DNA genome. I think the cool fact is that 64% of the open reading frames, <laughs> 523 of them, are orphans. Wow. I love the name O-R-F-A-N-S because they don't look like anything else that we yes. have in the database. And this includes all the other giant viruses of, who, of which 50% of their uh, orphs are orphans as well. And you, you were saying earlier that none of them match with each other. Some of them do. I mean, the orphans. No, that's why they're orphans. Exactly. Right? So there's right. a whole set of organisms or things that, out there that we have yet to discover where these are related. Well, the thing is you've got to figure out what they are and what they do, and that's hard. Uh, because well, when you have so many, it's a lot of work, and which uh, one do you start with, uh, right? Yeah. Now, a smart person would say the most interesting one, but... <laughs> <laughs> I was also asking whether or not any of those genes were for metabolism. I didn't see any metabolic genes here. Lots of genes in DNA metabolism. Does that count? No. Why not? It's metabolism. Not You're really. talking about Krebs cycle Ener type things? Yeah, glycolysis. Or Transcription or, um, components, uh, protein kinases, phosphatases, translation protein. It all has to do with reproduction, but it has nothing to do with generating Energy. new... new Whatever you're going to call that, you're, you're trying stuff. to get at the origin of these, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, are they are they simplified cells or are they yeah, exa yeah, exactly viruses? right? Exactly right. You but know, some right. of these they, orphans might. Be are these are progenitors for uh, rickettsia or something like this? Right. Mm -hmm. To me, one of the uh, one of the fundamentally interesting things about these is there's a <clears throat> among these large uh, nucleocytoplasmic viruses, there are those that require or replicate in a nucleus and there are those that ignore the nucleus mm. and do it in the cytoplasm and making that uh, distinction is interesting and in this particular case uh, they uh, the, the experiments are really cool they show using uh, a fluorescently labeled uh, parental DNA molecule from the virus that the DNA goes to the nucleus I mm -hmm. thought that that was cool uh, they show that the nucleus uh, over time uh, more or less disintegrates mm -hmm. they show that some of the genes have introns that mm -hmm. implies right. nuclear functions. They show that the virus encodes transcription enzymes but does not package them into the virion, which implies that it uses a host RNA polymerase for the initial stages of the infection. Uh, and so the conclusion is that this is one of the viruses that uses the nucleus, even though in the end the nucleus is basically replaced by a, a, a viral factory. And I thought uh, the approaches to working that out and that whole thing as a concept amongst these viruses was really interesting. But I also, I also, as a non-virologist, but as a protozoology f uh, fan, noticed that the outer coating, I'm going to call it that, not a capsid, of this virus closely resembles some of the proteins that the cyst form of Acanthamoeba castellani have. Hmm. It's a smooth outer coating that looks nothing like a capsid. There's no capsid-like well, arrangement. Not, yeah, but it's not a capsid-like virus, Dixon. It's yeah, like well, an, more like an envelope virus. Uh, yeah. That's too smooth and irregular for an envelope. No, it's virus. not, Dixon. Absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely geometrically no. perfectly spherical. It's not geometrically perfect. I see it. But from you here. can't see it. Your eyes are bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's too small. It's not perfect at all. It's what it's made out of that I'm more intrigued with. Mm, why don't you work on it? Why don't I work? There are period. 230 <laughs> virion proteins, Dixon. Yeah, but that ex uh, how many altogether in the virus particle? Yeah, how many altogether? Five hundred and yeah, something. Exactly. Look so at that. Over half, half. Half of the proteins are in the capsid, and also ribosomal proteins are packaged in there as well. Interesting, right? Why are they there? Do they need it, or exactly. are they just picked up? So, right. What What I thought was interesting is they went back to the core and they did deep sequencing of nucleic acid in the core sample to see, ah. you know, what's in there. Ah. And they say they find both 
this virus and uh, Pandora virus, which of course they isolated from the same core, and they also find acanthamoeba, and in roughly uh, similar levels, depending on the, the DNA sequence reads. So they're there. They also say they don't find any herpes viruses or pox viruses in this ice sample. I wonder if they they found anything else. They don't really tell you uh, the data, like any other viruses at all, or microbes, or microbes, or anything. Yeah, yeah. So on this uh, subject of the thawing of the permafrost, mm-hmm. I wanted to I wanted to say that this is uh, not a new idea um, that people have been talking about this. I would say even for decades, in particular as a possible source. Uh, for reemergence of uh, pox viruses, smallpox, and, yes. and smallpox in particular, mm-hmm. and there's been a fair amount of uh, work. I, we've even discussed some of this stuff. A fair amount of work put into the probability that that might happen. And I, the bottom line, the way I see it at this point, is that the probability that something is really nasty is going to come out of thawing permafrost is very low, very yes. low. Almost, yes, you'd, you'd yeah, have to effectively have, negligible. You'd have to have a susceptible host there to catch it when it thaws. Otherwise, these viruses are just going to break down. Yeah, I mean, look at all the they're frozen. Uh, mammoths and, that they've uncovered. I mean, they must have their intact microbiome. I mean, mm, kind yeah, of intact. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they've been frozen solid for those numbers of years, but still. I mean, and the Ice Man, Itzy. I, I, mm-hmm. I wonder how mm-hmm. many things have been able to isolate off of that cadaver. Have yeah. they? Have I, they tried? I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just raising this as an issue that uh, if they haven't, they've been silly. I think they should have tried by now, and I haven't seen the results of that. Right. You I guess the thing, the thing it, about this paper that's relevant in this regard is that they were able to take some of this uh, core material and just slop it onto a <laughs> cell, right. culture, cell right. culture and get something to grow, implying that, well, proving, in fact, that whatever was in the uh, core sample was still active. Correct. Mm-hmm. But I'm, right. I, it's it's recoverable. It's not the sure. same as active, like able to spread just from somebody walking past there while they're going to drill a gas well. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it is it is far 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 more disturbing what we're doing to tropical regions of the world where there are lots yeah, yeah. and lots and lots of organisms flying around and you're getting bitten by mosquitoes all the time um, and we're increasing our surface area and interface with those types of environments, that's where you're going to get your next emerging infection, not from some empty tundra that somebody's uh, working in all bundled up. I think seasonal flu is more of a threat than this. Yes, (laughs) by far. Dixon, so they found a frozen person in this permafrost? In Switzerland, yeah. Itzy, yeah, and so I've what, seen him. How old is this person? 4,000 years old. So it's homo sapiens. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure. yeah. And, in fact, he was uh, murdered. <laughs> there is a paper that describes <laughs> characterizing extinct human gut microbiomes yes. in PLOS One from yes. 2012. Yes. And they mention um, that to provide an idealized scenario for sample preservation, we also applied source tracking to previously published data for Itzy the Iceman and a soldier frozen for 93 years on a glacier. Huh. The studies reveal that human microbiome data has been preserved in some coprolites, and these preserved human microbiomes hmm. match more closely to those from the rural communities than to those from cosmopolitan communities. And by coprolites, they mean paleofeces. They do. Mm. Probably, yes. That's you're right. right. That's right. So, by the way, I now recall the reporter who I spoke with. He said it's it's got Franken virus because of the reanimation idea. Oh, right. Which, and I said uh, it's not really reanimation no. because it's just frozen. It re- maintains its infectivity like my virus in the freezer, right? So, but he right. said that's where it came from. Uh, mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that would be more Dad. of a zombie virus. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and Itzy is actually in Italy. Mm-hmm. So he was uh, oh, yeah. recovered. Italian Alps. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's there right. was, yeah. there, as I recall, there was quite a dispute about that. Right. Because yeah. he was recovered from the Alps and Switzerland wanted him and Italy wanted him. <laughs> they, it's true. They, yeah. It's true. Anyway, he's in Italy now. Has yes. anyone tried to isolate any microbe from it? Do you know? Does anyone know? Um, 
I'm, it seemed to be the right thing to do or sequence something. They did right? a CAT scan. They did a whole. Dis- they did a Nova show on him. And, they uh, found copper particles and arsenic in his hair. Yeah, and uh, there's huge amount of stuff. It would be fun to go back and visit that museum. There's a whole museum about him. Arrow um, between his ribs. Really? Yeah. yeah, that's how he was killed. Uh, not, they the changed thing. how they thought he died. Well, he had a full meal in his stomach. Cause of death. Initial speculation. <laughs> they thought it was from exposure. Right. Then they, they thought sure he was the victim was of a ritual lethal sacrifice. Wound. Right. Yeah. The, the story um, I heard on TV on this Nova show was that he must have been killed by a friend because the night before, uh, his stomach was full of a meal that he had consumed. And then they went through the meal and what was in that meal. And the next morning, apparently, as he was walking off, he was shot and killed. Before he had a chance to fully digest. Somebody his iced him. S- ah, someone right. iced him. Right. Wow, very good. All right. Uh, our last uh, follow-up is from our friend Grant McFadden, who writes, Hey, Vincent et al., I know you guys all know this, but the flu gain-of-function ban lumbers on and nobody in the wider media <laughs> seems to report on the growing harm it has caused. This report at least indicates why flu goff, oh, that's a nice name, flu goff <laughs> research can provide still-needed advances. He sends a link to an article in, in a University of Wisconsin uh, Ma- Madison publication, uh, reporting on research done by Yoshi Kawaoka. I also found a uh, a nice report in Science. I'm not sure if you've interviewed Yoshi in the past on Twitter, but even if you have, perhaps it might be a good time to let him articulate again why this research matters. So we did have Yoshi on the same episode as Dennis Ruby, in fact, which Rich just mentioned. Uh, but I, he didn't talk about this because at the time it was not an issue. But I think we could get him back. It would be fun. I'm sure he would do it. He he uh, appreciates what we do. Uh, the paper, at the time, at the, t- at, yeah. at the time, it had not really blown. I think the NSABB stuff had had. There was a yes. the flap mm-hmm. about gain of function was ongoing, but the moratorium had not. That's happened, right. There was no moratorium, so we really didn't talk much about that. We talked about his science in H5N1. Uh, the paper is quite interesting, and this paper was – the work was done before the moratorium, so it wasn't affected. But these two articles uh, talk about how this work would likely have fallen under the moratorium because it involves adding a new function to uh, influenza virus. Right. Uh, the title of the paper is Development of High-Yield Influenza A Virus Vaccine Viruses. And as everyone knows, you know, we have to – produce a lot of influenza virus vaccine. We change it every one to five years as the virus changes. Uh, The vaccine can be made in cell cultures or in eggs. And typically the way you produce a vaccine, because it changes routinely, you take the genes, the viral genes encoding the surface glycoproteins, the HA and the NA, and you put them in a virus. It's called PR8 which is known to really grow well in eggs and in cell culture. So the the clinical isolates typically don't grow well, so you don't want to use those. So you use the virus backbone, so to speak. So what Yoshi and his lab did, which is really, it's quite an involved paper, a lot of data, really good stuff. They um, mutated each segment of this uh, PR8 backbone virus, if you will, in an attempt to get a virus that grew better. They mutated each segment. They made thousands of variants. They generated these viruses in pools. They then passaged them in in MDCK cells, which are used, one of the cells used to produce the virus vaccine. And then they identified the ones that grew best. They sequenced them. Uh, They ended up reintroducing the changes into virus to prove that they improved the yield. And they end up with a, uh, a, a new backbone virus derived from PR1, which has, I think, seven different mutations and different proteins that grows better uh, than the original virus. And they do experiments in mice. They show that it's genetically stable, not more pathogenic, and so forth. Uh, And so the the effect of this is quite interesting. Uh, So this is called PR8HY for high yield. Um, in some cases, they get from 4 to 269-fold increases uh, compared to the original virus. So it's it can be respectable. But it's not always constant because it depends on, you know, which HA and which NA that you put in. So, you know, whether or not companies are going to use this or not, we'll see. But it's really an interesting piece of work. It's gain of function. You're getting the virus to grow better in cells. And this would have been prohibited 
the moment. So it's and crazy. This is really, really an important problem. Yeah, because um, I mean, you get these you get these yield variations and and this whole scramble to develop each season's vaccine, and and then you get one that grows poorly, either in eggs or in cell culture. And of course, they all everybody wants to to transition to the cell culture based vaccines. But then if you get one that doesn't grow well in that, that's your whole production line, and yeah. the the momentum of these systems is is huge. So if you've got one that grows poorly in cell lines, that's the difference between having your, your vaccine available ahead of the flu season and not having it available until the middle of the flu season, maybe, uh, if you can't fix the problem. So the, yeah, the, the original goal was to get this to grow better in cell culture, but it turns out it also grows better in eggs. Yes. So you could use it in both. And so, this, yeah, this is really important stuff. And uh, as, as Arturo Casadeval said in one of these articles, a moratorium is a blunt edged instrument yes you know you're going to get stuff that really needs to be done um and i still do not understand to this day why we have a moratorium why can't we just have a discussion and let the work continue there was yes. no nothing of imminent danger that required a moratorium can someone out there please <laughs> explain and and you not you not you no please explain <laughs> why we need a moratorium and the people that need to explain it are not listening. That's the problem. That's right. The people who advocated the moratorium are the ones who need to justify it, but now they don't feel they need to justify it because they feel like they won. But yeah. I, f I feel that Tony Fauci must be behind this in some way because he's head of NIAID, right? I don't think he had a lot of choice. Well, he came from the White House originally, right? So you think right. they said to him, we have to do this? Who in the White House did this? Well, <laughs> well we, maybe we don't need names, but why? Why? <laughs> Why is because there was this huge public dust up about it at the time, mm -hmm. and and so the thing to do was well let's just let's just silence this whole mess um, for a little while, and then it got forgotten about, and a little while has turned into this. I don't know if it's permanent, but this ban on uh, critically important research, and yes, that needs to be reversed. So there is a report. Do I believe September twenty eighth? Yes, from the uh, agency that has been contracted to do the risk benefit analysis. Right. I believe so. Sometime towards the end of this month, we should have at least some news regarding the future on this. And I have no idea how they're going to do that analysis. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And then, the, yeah. Then there'll be the government shutdown and nothing will be able yes, to happen right. <laughs> to change it, even if the report advocated releasing right. the shutdown. And all the research will be shut down. Right. Mm. All right. Thank you, Grant. And we'll see if we can get Yoshi on to talk about this. And finally, we have an email from Heather. Maybe you could take that, uh, Kathy. Sure. Dear esteemed doctors, apologies ahead of time for the length of this email. I tried, but succinctness was never my strong suit. If you would prefer to edit or summarize it for the show, feel free to do so. I've been listening to and enjoying all of your podcasts since Dr. Kiki of This Week in Science suggested TWIV to her listeners during the ferret flu kerfuffle. Thank you for providing such an entertaining and informative show. I'm not a scientist by trade, regrettably. I work at a laser manufacturing company in a low-level position that keeps my hands busy but not my brain. <laughs> Science podcasts such as yours get me through my workday. I was recently adopted by a feral tomcat who ended up being FIV positive. So that's feline immunodeficiency virus. Imagine my vet surprise when I began asking a barrage of questions directly <laughs> inspired by your show. After we confirmed diagnosis with PCR, I dove into the literature and found it fascinating. The parallels between HIV and FIV make it a potential animal model for translational research. I even saw a few tantalizing abstracts suggesting that FIV could be a potential new viral vector for targeted human gene therapy. Of course, I'm most interested in the disease as it relates to its feline host, and here again, I'm deeply intrigued by what little I'm able to read for free. Shakes her fist at Elsevier. <laughs> as do we all, Heather. As do we all. Perhaps if the good doctors of TWIB find this as interesting as I do, an episode on the topic might be in order. I could send a few open access papers your way to aid the discussion if it would be helpful. I would love to hear your thoughts on whether or not we could give FIV the parentheses zinc 
finger, or in what applications it might be useful as a therapeutic vector. Why don't we have antiretroviral therapy for cats? It seemed to work in the papers I saw, but it never made it to market. And why is an article from 2002 locked behind a paywall? <laughs> oh, wait, we know the answer to that one. <laughs> Thanks again to the entire Twix team. I am deeply enriched by your sharing of knowledge, and the delightful rapport of the hosts makes each show feel like a cheerful discussion among friends. With deepest respect and admiration, Heather. P.S. Currently 24.5 degrees Celsius, 76.1 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% humidity, scattered clouds at 12,000 feet, mostly cloudy at 20,000 feet, and generally quite lovely in Golden, Colorado. <laughs> Which is at 30,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I uh, like this because I figured Alan could have a fun with the titles with this one. Yes. <laughs> and, he he has. and he did. And he did. I have. <laughs> Um, so I put I put together a few articles here, and I thought we could chat about FIV a bit uh, for Heather and our listeners. It's a really interesting virus, and I, I want to start with the first paper that described this virus. It was a science paper published in 1986, and it's kind of fuzzy, so you can tell it's from the old yes. days. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated from high school in 1986. Wow. It's actually, February 1987. 87? It, yeah, it came out in, in 87, right? Mm -hmm. Did the publication date 86? Why uh, do I say 86? Okay, there 87. Was, yeah, February 87. So you were uh, still in high school? Uh, I was uh, 87. I was um, freshman year in college. I'd been here for five years, as uh, and, and all you other guys were at... Your jobs are ready, too, because you're old, old like I am. I was nearing retirement then. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not true. Actually. So the, the, the paper is isolation of a T lymphotropic virus from domestic cats with an immunodeficiency-like syndrome. So remember, this is, what, four years after HIV was identified in humans? Mm -hmm. It was initially called the human T lymphotropic virus or LA lymphadenopathy virus by the French and eventually was called HIV. And this was isolated, this is kind of cool, from a cattery in Petaluma, California. Now, Petaluma is an interesting place because that is the home of the Twit Studio, This Week in Tech, really? which is run by Leo Laporte, and it was his podcast that I used to listen to initially and got the inspiration to do This Week in Virology. Ah. Right? Twit, Twiv. In fact, he reviewed Twiv on one of his shows years ago. We got a big bump from that, so he's aware of us. So Petaluma, isn't I've, that cool? I've been to Petaluma. It's a lovely little <clears> town. <throat> so he's got a studio in downtown Petaluma. You should go check it out. You can go to twit.tv and look inside the studio. It's just beautiful. I salivate over that studio. <laughs> it is so beautiful. But, of course, he brings in millions of dollars in ads because he has 40 shows that have thousands, tens of thousands of millions of listeners, and right. we just can't get close. But anyway... That's that's why this whole story is amazing because it's Petaluma. So they, this is a cattery. It's a place where you, they they used to keep, um, I guess, mostly cats that were rescued. They kept right. them in pens uh -huh. outside or inside. They had forty some odd uh, animals. Cattery. These are abandoned pets of Petaluma. Ah, that's, that's right. Mm. Petaluma. Right there you go. <laughs> and uh, you know these. There are a variety of viruses of cats that are known at this time, feline leukemia virus, feline sarcoma virus, and a couple of others. Um, this um, cattery was pretty healthy uh, for a while, but then uh, they got a four-month-old female kitten introduced to uh, Pen D. So they had pens A through E, five outdoor pens. And they were always kept in these pens. Right, that's it. You come and you sit in the pen and you can't wander around. And then uh, the um, this cat started getting sick, the diarrhea, rhinitis, conjunctivitis. Went on for a couple of years uh, and eventually the cat died. And then subsequently, this is between 82 and 86, nine other cats from Pen D developed a similar illness. So they And figured, only, what, two other cats from other pens. Yeah. So, so it's it's really... Uh, focused on Pen D. Right. So the paper is a lovely exercise in how to identify an infectious agent because that's what they think this is. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they did, they took some uh, blood from this cat who had died and they injected it into a pathogen-free kitten, which you have to buy, right? Uh, 
and they put it at your peritoneally and show that basically these cats get sick as well. They try and grow the agent in a variety of cells, and they find that uh, they grow in uh, peripheral blood lymphocytes quite well. When you add uh, blood from sick or infected animals, uh, the cells develop cytopathic effects. So it looks like a virus is there. And they find that there's reverse transcriptase. They actually, excuse me. Yep. Excuse me. They actually infected <clears throat> two uh, specific pathogen-free right. cats. Yep. Right. One with unfiltered material and another with material that had been filtered with a 0.2, 0.2. micron yep. filter that should hold back bacteria and stuff. And uh, both cats got sick. Right. So the implication of that is that, well, it's the... It's the classic definition of a virus, a filterable agent. That's exactly right. And these, uh, this, the development of cytopathic effect is associated with reverse transcriptase. They do reverse transcriptase assays of the medium, and so it looks like this is a, a retrovirus. One of the things I like about this is that they uh, do they assay the biochemical properties. Mm-hmm of the reverse transcriptase in particular, comparing its optima for activity in different concentrations of manganese and magnesium, two different bivalent metals uh, that are used as cofactors uh, in these enzymes. And they notice that uh, this enzyme is um, active in, which one of these is it? Is it it's magnesium, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with the same sort of profile as the HIV reverse transcriptase in contrast to the reverse transcriptase from feline leukemia virus, which is uh, more active in manganese than magnesium. I just thought that was a, an interesting sort of way to try and discriminate what class of virus this is. Yep. Yes. They have an electron micrograph of an infected lymphocyte, and you can see virus particles. They look like typical... Uh, lentiviruses, which HIV is, they um, then they do some serology. They find all all the cats uh, do not have uh, antibodies against HIV, so this virus is distinct, non non cross reactive, and um, m- no most of the infected animals uh, in the serological survey are in Pen D. They only found two others in other pens. Forty uh, percent of the Unhealthy cats in this in this cattery had antibodies to the new virus, and none uh, of these cats had other viruses. Uh, didn't have feline leukemia. Some were seropositive for feline sarcoma and infectious peritonitis virus, which is a corona virus, I believe. I had a cat that died from that. Yeah, FIP. Yep. Yep. It's a nasty one. It is. I had a Quick. cat that died from. I had a cat that died from feline leukemia. Oof. That was a tragedy. That was one of my gr- best cats. Huh. Mm. It's not the one you called stupid, right? That was stupid. Really? Mm. He had a cat called yeah. stupid. I had a cat, had called, a cat Ahab. called stupid. We called ours. <laughs> you know, Ahab. when I was a kid, we had cats, and they always used to die after a couple of years. Yeah. I guess well, you was, probably let them outside, right? Yeah, that's, I was thinking <laughs> as I was it, driving yeah. in, we just yep. used to let them out, and that's the killer yep. here, right? Yeah. That does it. Yep. Because uh, they would always get in fights and come back, cut up, and then they'd get exactly, sick. Exactly. Either that or they got run over. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that happened. That they happened. Just, hours. Yeah. Or they run They away. just disappear. That's right. Just, yeah, you don't or see them anymore. Them. I once we had a cat that was uh, uh, aging and sick, and so I looked up to find out what the lifespan of a cat was, huh. and uh, the answer was it depends. If you keep them inside, we're talking fifteen years. If you let them out, we're talking three. Yep. Yep. Right. So some of the clinical signs in these ten cats that were seropositive for the virus: rhinitis. Uh, thinness, anemia. One of the animals had bacterial cystitis, which they say is uncommon in cats. It responds to uh, antibiotics, so that's a bacterial infection. They could transmit this virus. They could grow it in culture, transmit it to other animals, recover it from them. And they did all the nice Koch postulates. And uh, a, s- a survey of cats elsewhere showed that the virus is in diseased cats in many ge- geographic areas of northern California. So they called it uh, tentatively feline T-lymphotropic lentivirus, and they say um, the designation of FIV, feline immunodeficiency virus, would be somewhat presumptuous at this time. I thought that was cool. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And eventually it was changed to FIV um, because that's, as Heather says, that's what 
we know of it now. So enough evidence accumulated in subsequent years showing that this is an immunosuppressive virus, as is HIV. No evidence for cat-to-human or human-to-cat transmission of this virus. doesn't infect human cells. So if you have a cat with FIV, it is not going to infect you. Right. It will infect other cats. So that's the discovery. I think it was a nice paper, this discovery paper. And I don't think... Hey, go ahead, guys. I was going to comment on the authors. So yep. yeah. uh, Marlo Brown is the yes. veterinarian, most likely from Petaluma Veterinary Hospital. And then the others are Niels Peterson, Esther Ho, and Janet Yamamoto from UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And I wanted Janet to... Yama, Janet uh, Yamamoto subsequently moved to University of Florida, where she is now. Oh. Yeah. So I, I think I'm speculating a little bit here, but I think Marlo Brown probably deserves credit for... Um, for maybe initiating this because my guess mm -hmm. is that that's the veterinarian who yeah. noticed this and said hey we've got a natural experiment going on here and probably you know found some researchers <laughs> to take it on but that's just a guess but yep. that seems reasonable so the virus the genome was subsequently cloned in sequence is clearly a lentivirus if you look at a phylogenetic tree the feline immunodeficiency virus and, and there have since been many different ones isolated from different kinds of cats, including lions and pumas. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, lentivirus just for a sure, second. Sure, Because retro, the basic retrovirus has three different genes, GAG, PAUL, and ENV. GAG is the core protein, PAUL is the polymerase, and ENV is the surface protein. And what distinguishes lentiviruses is they are more complex. They have a bunch of what generically are called accessory proteins like REV and VIF and VPR and all of that kind of stuff. Right. So if you look at all the lentis, the FIVs cluster on their own on a phylogenetic tree. And other lentis, of course, SIV and HIV, bovine immunodeficiency virus, equine infectious anemia virus, and their goat uh, lentiviruses as well. And as uh, Rich said, it's a complex retrovirus. It has these accessory proteins. These uh, FIVs have like RAV and VIF and TAT that do various things in the life so cycle. So do they all infect CD4 cells? We'll see, Dixon. We're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Good question. Actually, I'd like to kind of... Uh, skip ahead relative to our <laughs> agenda because if yeah, you're talking okay. about phylogenetics this is a good time to do this yep. um, there are nine different clades each they're species specific of the and virus they mean, right? of the virus okay. and they uh, infect uh, nine different specific lineages of a cat including uh, let me see here I've got it I've got it I've got it um, lions is one uh, species group, if you like. The palace cat is another. Leopard, cheetah, jaggerundi, ocelot, domestic cat, puma, and spotted hyena. Uh, and so these, uh, currently, hmm. there are these nine different clades of virus that are very specific for these different feline species, but it's uh, a large fraction of the feline species that uh, are uh, th that have these viruses, and if you do the phylogenetics, it looks like there's a common ancestor, uh, as if the primordial uh, feline was infected, and it would be uh, over 10 million years ago with right. the retrovirus, and it subsequently speciated with the animals. So okay, I, I've just learned that hyenas are felines. Uh, interesting, huh? I didn't know that. I thought they were well, Kennedy. They, uh, well, that's they've got them here as okay, part I mean, of this whole thing. Yeah, I'm not going to argue. I was just saying. I've, they I they that. they do look yeah, like a deeply yeah. deeply rooted branch on this be tree. Darn. Feliforms, Dixon. I'll yep. be darned. Yeah, you can learn something on Twiv, right? You Dixon? can learn something. <laughs> on Twiv. So, uh, Rich, it looks like lions have really a high percentage of uh -huh. uh, FIV positivity. Uh, in fact, the lions have a problem with this. I think that uh, uh, it has done some damage to the lion population in Africa. I think that's correct. Hmm. So do we know... So cats have probably been infected for millions of years then. That's yeah. That's what this is telling it us. Goes, yes, it goes back more than 10. That's, that 
the first branch on the felid tree mm. is 10 million years old. Now, given how ancient this is, I mean, you say it's doing some damage to the lions, um, but that's probably always been going on. And we're only, we're only noticing it now because, you know, things like the bullets are doing so much yeah. more damage to the lions. Yeah, sure. yeah. And, and that's the arrows from dentists also. Yes. Oh, yes. That's uh, that's uh, qualified. I, I I need to check what the status of that is, hmm. mm -hmm. which I have not done. So the mortality occurs after, or during, or before they reach reproductive age. Sorry, the, the mortality. The mortality of the virus infection in lions. Mm, if know. it's really doing, I a, see. a number on them. It, is it? Occurring? I see. Good question. Yeah, I, I, because they like the Okavango. Um, crater in uh, Tanzania has a captured group of 13 different families of lions, as I recall, and they're in red. And so those, those should have died out if this was a real problem. Hmm. There's almost no poaching or hunting in that crater because of its, uh, its ease of patrolling. So there's a lot of, there, there are a fixed number of lions and a fixed number of prey, and so it's used in a lot of ecological studies. But it would be uh, interesting to know whether or not they've been affected by this virus in a way that affected their population. Or is it a late-onset disease? Well, in cats, in, in house cats anyway, we'll talk about that. Mm. You know, there are two phases, just like HIV. Yeah. So I found a nice website at Cornell, the College of Veterinary Medicine on, on FIV, and they talk all about this. And um, they say that in the U.S., healthy cats, one to one and a half to three percent are infected. And in sick cats, it goes up to 15%. Uh -huh. um, and biting is the way, the most efficient oh, way of really? transmitting. So free-roaming, aggressive males are mostly infected. Like the Tasmanian facial virus. And if you, uh, it's not a virus, dude. This What's is a cancer. A it's a cancer. The oh, Tasmanian yeah. okay, facial okay, cancer. Okay, 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 okay. House, if you keep your cat inside, it most, most likely won't get infected as right. long as you don't put another cat right. in that's infected. Right. So biting and uh, fighting and that sort of thing. Huh. Sexual contact is not a major means of spreading the virus. One of the things I found interesting from that Cornell page was um, them talking about how you can test for the virus, and, yep. and they test for presence of the antibody in the blood. And uh, a negative result can come from a cat in a very late stage of infection because their immune systems are so compromised that they no longer produce detectable levels of antibody. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was really a surprising fact. And they also say that you usually you want two different ways of uh, confirming infection, antibody and maybe PCR. So this has a, a disease phase very much like HIV. The cats get infected. There's an acute phase that may last days to weeks. And you get these flu-like symptoms, swollen lymph nodes, fever, lethargy, rashes, conjunctivitis. There's also neurologic symptoms as well. And then the cats recover. And then you have a long period, which can be years, where there's you know a low level of virus. Actually, the virus may or may not be detectable in that interim. It's replicating Dixon in CD4 positive T cells, and it's destroying them. It has other effects on the immune system. Eventually, it also replicates in uh, CD8 T cells and monocytes and macrophages, and then you get an immunodeficiency, and you get opportunistic infections of all sorts, and that can end up killing the cat, of course, unless uh, you, you take care of those. Um, so you get depletion of CD4 cells, very much like HIV infection. And as Heather suggested, this has been used as a model for studying um, the infection by HIV because cats are cheaper and easier to use than primates. Right. Uh, and so they have been used, and the virus is similar enough, and the course of infection is similar enough. But there are differences, again. Like, for example, what's interesting, HIV binds to CD4, as a receptor and then binds to one of two co-receptors. And this virus, FIV, binds to a protein called CD134 on CD4 positive T cells. Um, then it also so, attaches so to... So I was going to say, Dixon, that's the answer to your question yeah, about yeah. does it infect CD4 yeah, yeah, T cells. Yeah, but it doesn't use the CD4 <coughs> molecule as a receptor. Right, it right. uses CD134 and then a co-receptor is CXCR4, just like uh, H some strains of HIV-1. Now, in the course of an HIV infection, the virus changes the co-receptor uh, that it attaches to. So the virus, HIVs that are transmitted, the co-receptor is typically CCR5. And then in the course of infection, CXCR4 binding viruses predominate. 
And interestingly, for FIV, the place on CD134 where the virus binds also evolves during infection as well. It starts out at one place and then uh, goes to another. And I found that uh, an interesting factoid. There is a vaccine made by Pfizer, which is called Felovax. And this contains inactivated petalumavirus, so the initial isolate, uh, which is um, is, is called a CDR2-independent virus. So CDR2 is one of the parts of CD134 that is bound by the virus. And this happens to be a virus that was isolated, which doesn't bind to that part of the protein. It binds elsewhere in CD134. So that's the pathogenesis of uh, this infection. And, you know, it can be variable. Some cats can be fine and... um, some cats can be very sick from it. They can also develop cancers of various sorts, right, just like HIV because it's an immunosuppressive virus and uh, the immune system is important for clearing uh, tumors as well. Now, Heather had asked about drugs and why don't you treat cats with antiretrovirus. So I did find a paper, which we'll link to, we'll link to all these, where they they review all the HIV antiretroviruses, over 35 or 40 of them, and that have been tested on FIV, and some of them work. Some of them inhibit FIV as well. There are lots of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. There's an integrase inhibitor. Um, there's a protease inhibitor. There's a CXCR4 entry inhibitor. And one of the, you know they're not used very much, but I did find some websites where um, they talk about there's one drug, uh, one of these HIV drugs that's approved for use in FIV infected cats, and that's AZT the first HIV drug. And, you know, Heather said, why don't we use any of the others? And I found actually a site where people talk about this. It's called (laughs) fivtherapy.com. And as a person running the site apparently has an infected cat and is experimenting with treating this cat with different uh, uh, antiretrovirals. And, you know, the thing is, why don't we use triple therapy on these cats? Well, basically, it's never been tested and veterinarians don't use it they're not going to use something that hasn't been tested and approved i think and that's the bottom line i think also the side effects are quite high for a lot of these and maybe that's worse than the disease in some of these animals right there's the the side effects are serious you're doing this to a cat which can't understand that the side effects are dealing with a disease um and so there's that whole question of is it is it even humane to apply a treatment like that. I know people uh, sometimes a cat gets cancer and people will put it through a course of chemotherapy, which I personally don't agree with because mm. I, I don't think that a cat can process what's going on there as being good for it. Yeah. Um, so there's that whole issue. And then also, you know, these, these drugs are not cheap. Yes. But as you, a lot of people would pay anything to take care of their their cat. Sure. Course. And in this this site, you know, you can uh, one this person's cat was given heart this past August, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy. It's a triple drug combination, and they're documenting what's happening there. But you you know, it might be hard to get a veterinarian to do that. They actually talk about how to convince your vet to get <laughs> the drug and give it to your cat. It's very right. So I have another question, and that is that uh, in humans, at least. With regards to HIV, uh, in France, this is where this data emerged from, um, latent uh, toxoplasma infections uh, with HIV infection superimposed on top activated the HIV infection and they died from encephalitis. Mm. I wondered, since cat is the definitive host for toxoplasma and since all the cats in Petaluma and other places too in catteries are, are kept outdoors, so mice, an occasional mouse, sure. is a possibility at least. I wonder how many cats actually die from that infection yeah, rather than sure. some of these other intercurrent infections that you mentioned. Right. Just, you know. So, so one thing we should point out is that just like HIV, mm-hmm. there is a, a latent reservoir of provirus infected cells, cells with the viral DNA integrated. We talked with uh, Kathy Collins uh, a long time ago from University of Michigan about this for HIV. And they don't know what the reservoir is for FIV. So, um, you know, it's hard. You can't clear infection with current therapies. You would just be lowering the virus load. And, you know, we don't know what that would do to a cat. So I think there are a lot of reasons why it's not routine treatment. But, you know, Heather, if you're really interested, you can possibly talk your vet into doing this. The other question she had is why uh, some people are using these as viral vectors for therapies. And it's true. I found a review paper 
where a group is working on developing FIV for vectors. As you know, lentivirus vectors are widely used in experimental gene therapy applications. Um, they're derived from HIV primarily, and they're, they're, treated, they're treated in such a way that they're not infectious. They're given a different viral glycoprotein to make them infect many cells, but they're useful because they infect non-dividing cells, not just dividing cells, and you can deliver genes. And FIV vectors have very similar properties, I think one of the main advantages is that they do not infect uh, they do not infect human cells. They will transduce a gene and put it in, but they, there's no possibility that they are going to propagate in humans. And so, f- this may end up being a uh, a positive in the long run. I know here, you know, we have lots of lentivirus uh, human gene therapy protocols, and be, I'm on a biosafety committee that reviews a lot of them and there and there are always accidents uh, where people you know stick themselves with the vector and they're worried that they're HIV based so that they're going to have problems and you know this would get around that for people who are worried about that I don't really know how likely it is that the FIV will go forward but I suppose it's theoretically possible this uh gene therapy paper that you're talking about um, mentions that FIV vectors can transduce a lot of cell types in the brain, eye, airway, hematopoietic system, liver, muscle, and pancreas. And they do comment on what you were just saying. Although HIV vectors are demonstrably safe in the research setting, it's our experience that in research labs not oriented toward virology or gene therapy, some personnel are reluctant to work with even replication defective HIV systems. Yeah. And so they find that something like the FIV system would be more uh, acceptable. It's amazing how many non-virology labs are working with lentiviral vectors, <laughs> you know, yeah. just, just to produce a protein in a cell, and they, they don't really know what they're doing, right? Right. Just following a protocol. Yeah. Anyway, that's, so those are some highlights, I think. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, issue a correction on the lion thing. Yep. Because I've been doing some research while you guys have been yakking about this. <laughs> 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 uh, so it turns out that upwards of a hundred percent of lions in the Serengeti are infected with one of three different subtypes of oh. the lion uh, FIV, but it doesn't seem to do them a lot of harm. Much the same as in the uh, domestic cat. We we have a there's a pretty much an equilibrium situation. There's some difference in mortality in the different uh, uh, subtypes, but uh, by and large, uh, the virus and the lions are getting along with each other. Neat. Hmm. Finally, we should mention that in ancient times, cats were worshipped as gods. They have not forgotten this. (laughs) <laughs> Who put that true. in? This is wonderful. Is I, that put, I, put the, I put that in there. And this cat is so beautiful with black hair yeah, with those eyes. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, the Egyptians really They worshipped them? And so I didn't realize that was a Terry Pratchett quote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that cats. fits. Cats. Yeah. All right, let's do a couple of email. Rich, I think you're next with uh, Anthony. Okay, Anthony writes, uh, re-virulence of avian influenza in poultry and industrial farming. If I understood correctly, Alan Dove speculated that the virulence of avian influenza in poultry could be caused by the population size and density of industrial farming. In the wild, waterfowl can be found in large flocks. Plus, these birds generally will be uh, drinking water contaminated with virus-laden droppings. Paul E. Wilde's hypothesis on virulence, and he gives a reference to it, provides a key. In nature, birds and bats' only defense is quite literally flight. They have high energy requirements. They won't be sick for very long. When to any degree they lose their edge, they quickly die or are killed. In the wild, virulent avian influenza quickly loses its means of production and transportation. For wild waterfowl, viruses tend to be persistent. Domestic animals are protected from predators and provided with food. People move sick birds and their droppings to different distant locations, providing fresh opportunity for the virus to spread. Viruses so uh, can increase so viruses can increase in virulence. <coughs> the wet markets of cities in South. Uh, of South China are a very different situation. 
Here, chickens, waterfowl, and exotic animals from a variety of sources are kept in crowded, unsanitary conditions. The customers looking over the animals exchange their human flu viruses with those of the birds. Perhaps coughing tourists provide novel influenza strains. <laughs> Wild birds perch on the cages, defecate in the water, and then fly off to their roosts. For those worried about gain-of-function experiments, here's the laboratory <laughs> out of a nightmare. <laughs> Thank you. You know, part of this reminds me of the paper that we did on uh, vaccination. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, and evolution of virulence. Encouraging an yeah. evolution of virulence. Yeah. Uh, here's another situation where um, influencing the, uh, where the, the um, health of the host, if you like, uh, influences potentially the evolution of, or, uh, or uh, of the viruses. Yep. So, right. And my my point um, about the uh, the poultry industry was essentially the same. That um, you know these are huge flocks of birds being raised in an industrialized setting that is fully supported and that could support an outbreak of this magnitude. Whereas in more traditional farming methods and in the wild, um, and of course chickens uh, are. Uh, chickens and and ducks that are raised commercially are bred for that, and they're they're somewhat different from their wild counterparts. Um, but in in any other situation besides that, you wouldn't be able to support this type of uh, of outbreak. So the, the uh, article he cites by Paul Ewald it's called "Evolution of Virulence," and unfortunately, right. it's published by El Sevier, so you're yes. probably not going to be able to see it. But this is sort of in line with an article that we cited a couple of weeks ago by Jim Bull and Adam Loring. It's about the evolution of virulence and, you know, what are the influences on it? And the, the idea is that disease organisms eventually become somewhat benign. And, he, you know, he notes that this is kind of a simplistic view, and he gives multiple examples of situations where um, you might not expect an evolution towards less virulence. For example, parasites transmitted by arthropods <laughs> right. can be transmitted well from immobilized hosts, so they shouldn't be subjected to this this idea that they uh, should yeah. be less virulent. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so he goes through a whole bunch of those, which is really nice, so I would highly mm -hmm. recommend it if mm -hmm. you can get behind that paywall. Well, Paul Uwald <laughs> has, um, he's been... He's been expounding on that theory for probably 20 years. That's true. And he has a book um, so this, about it as well. So right. This particular book, article right. is not the only right. source of that. You can find information about it extensively Absolutely. online. Sure. Um, and, and he was, uh, I think he really crystallized that notion that the, the evolution is whatsoever, whatever's in the interest of the pathogen getting passed on. It's not necessarily toward being benign unless that gets it passed on more. Right. Uh, Dixon, can you take this email from Dennis, please? I would be happy to. Uh, I should footnote this also by saying that at one point, Petaluma was known as the egg basket of the world, oh. and particularly the United States. So they had a lot of chickens there at one point, yeah. so they could have had another <laughs> series of epidemic uh, worries to... I'm surprised we put all our eggs in one place. Yeah, like we that. did, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that, too. Okay, so Dennis writes, Doc... This is about a yellow fever epidemic in the southern United States. During 1878 to 1879, I've been reading Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs covering the Civil War. This led to reading a Wikipedia page on General John Bell Hood. After the war, Bell married. Subsequently, they had 11 children, including three sets of twins. Here's how a yellow fever epidemic affected them. Quote, his insurance business was ruined by a yellow fever epidemic in New Orleans during the winter of 1878 through 1879. Then Hood himself succumbed to the disease, dying six days after his wife Anna succumbed, and on the same day their eldest daughter Lydia died, leaving ten destitute orphaned young children. They received support from over 20 years for the te from the Texas Brigade Association and were ultimately adopted by seven different families in Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Kentucky, and New York. In our lifetimes, few of us have had to live through killer virus epidemics, except for polio, HIV, malaria, and maybe measles. I'm prob I've probably missed some. 
But few of us in the U.S. and in Europe have lost multiple nuclear family members to all viruses, much less to one virus. We've come a long way, although there is much further to go. The accelerating rate of knowledge acquisition and application will bring huge health benefits over the coming years. Thanks again, Dennis. Get your vaccines. You betcha. Yep. Vaccines save lives. Yeah. By the way, it should be mentioned also that currently airing on at least my public television station is a remastering of the uh, Civil War mm-hmm. uh, episodes, and it's been absolutely <laughs> riv- you, you don't want to not watch this. It's just right. remarkably uh, well done, and the stories are just terrible, and, 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 and yet you still have to pay attention. I still don't understand what happened at Gettysburg. <laughs> you, know, you see that they go through day by day. They put the maps up. They show you where the people were. And I visited that war, that war site many times, and I still don't get what it must have been like to be there those four remarkable days in our history. It's just awful. unbelievable. It's yeah. awful. It is awful. And the description of there were so many shots being fired at one time that you could have put your hat out and filled them up with the mini balls. That's uh, incredible. I'm listening to a podcast on World War I. Oh, wow. It's yeah. like a 12-hour podcast, which yeah. was one of our listener picks. Oh, right. It's called <sighs> Hardcore History. Oh, is it good? One, <laughs> guy, one guy who's a history fanatic, he's not a professor. He's oh, yeah. just, do you know, I mean, so many people died every day. In, that yes. totally useless war. And, and there were days when the Brits would fire four million shells yeah. at the Germans. Unbelievable. Uh, Such destruction and loss of life for nothing. An epidemic typhus rampant and yep. all kinds of other diseases. It's that just stuff. amazing. Let's do a couple more here. Yeah. Uh, Brian writes, uh, I saw this great article about the Tasmanian devils getting immunized against the virus that's killing off their species with cancer. What virus? There's no, no virus. virus. It's just a <laughs> cancer that is transmitted <laughs> from animal to Even animal. Even I knew that. <laughs> because apparently these guys are immunosuppressed and they're inbred and they're, they don't have a good uh, way to clear this tumor. Yeah. So when they fight, they can transmit the tumor. It's one of only two known examples of a disease where cancer cells are infectious agents. Do you know, Dixon, yes, what the I do. other is? You yes, should I do. know. I do, I do, I do. What is it? It's uh, the muscles that are being studied right here. In Steve clams, Cuffs. steamer clams. Oh, steamer clams, okay. That's different from a muscle, you know. I know, okay. Then I guess I didn't know. <laughs> yes, it's a transmissible tumor of steamer clams. <laughs> but don't they have a retrovirus integrated into the genome? They do, but it's and not. Doesn't this one too? Doesn't the Tasmanian devil have one of those as well? well I'm sure they do, but uh, it's not clear that in, you know uh, the, the, the in the clams the retrovirus is amplified in the yeah, tumors. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not clear how and it's, it's transmitted related. through seawater. It's because well, they're filter the, yeah, feeders. That's right. So, but the, in both cases, it's the cancer cell that's yeah. transmitted. Yeah. So here they're making a vaccine. And there's a dog tumor that's transmitted this way too. Yeah, that's right. What's that one? Uh, it's a uterine cancer of some sort. And I think that's sexually transmitted. Yes, it right? is. That's Got it. Correct. So they're they're immunizing these uh, Tasmanian devils with cells to see if they can, yeah. you know, prevent mm. um, the, the disease from spreading. Because I believe it's threatening them, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it is. They, they were already not in great shape, and this is definitely not right. helping yeah. matters. That's right. On another note, this is my first email. <laughs> Ever? Wow. Oh, right. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> I've been listening for at least two years now. Love the podcast. Got into it after I found Vincent's class on iTunes U, uh, and he mentioned the podcast at the end of the course. Thank you for putting in the time to unveil a previous mysterious and scary profession. <laughs> and it's run by scary people, too. Yes. <laughs> it's now fascinating, and I can't get enough of it. It helps me get through my long days at work manufacturing boring stuff. Oh, dear. He makes drills. Drills. You know, I knew you were going to jump in there, Alan. I knew you were going to jump He's in the oil industry. <laughs> yes. Finally, I do have a question. Keeping this brief in case you read it on the show, have you done an episode on HPV? I'd really like to know about it. For instance, why, as a 37-year-old adult, does it seem they don't want me to get the vaccine? Why don't they test men for mm. HPV, only women? If you got one of the serotypes, wouldn't it still be worth getting the vaccine that covers the others? Brian in Fall City, Washington, currently 27C, down about 8 degrees from the weekend. Not sure if it's cloudy or it's just smoke from the wildfires. Right. Well, uh, Brian has been paying attention because those are all great questions. So we did a, we did an HPV 
Uh, it's 126. What's up, Doc, right? Mm-hmm. With Michelle Osborne. Michelle Osborne. And maybe a lot of these questions were answered, but we can still answer some. I found a great site on CDC website. It's basically a, um, it's a summary of a lot of data that have accumulated uh, over the years of using the HPV vaccines. It's the recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices with respect to HPV immunization. And I think it answers uh, most of your questions. Um, for example, the vaccine is not licensed for use in people over 26 years of age because they've hardly done any trials in that age group, and the one that they did um, has not shown good effect, uh, efficacy. They tested women up to age 45. Yeah. So you there's know, a you, there's a there's a good summary of the the why on that. It's a it, in terms of efficacy, it's a it's. It's funny because you do get an immune response and that kind of stuff, but the yeah. problem is that the background of uh, infection with HPV, I think, at that point is too high. I looked through this whole article and found at the end in the summary section a nice statement where they say that HPV vaccines are not licensed in the United States for use in persons aged greater than 26. Among women, the expected population level impact of HPV vaccination in this age group is lower than that for younger women because of the higher likelihood that women have already had vaccine type infection because fewer would have uh, would have incident infection that could be prevented and that the risk for development of disease from incident infection is less. So basically if you're over 26 years it's kind of too late it's not as if the vaccine won't work, okay? Uh, you'll still get, if you haven't been infected, you'll still get an immune response, and I would presume that would be uh, protective. But it's kind of, what's the phrase? That ship Closing a barn door. Yes. For, for, yeah. yeah, that ship has sailed. Closing right. a barn door after the horse got out. And, and yep. this is all, they make these judgments based on stuff like uh, cost effectiveness of yep. the vaccine right. on a population scale. On an individual scale, uh, it's not going to hurt you. If it's now, if it's not been licensed, uh, a doctor is not forbidden from giving it to you, are they? They can do it basically off label. They can right? do it essentially off label. Yes, you right. could ask for it. But you'd you'd be paying for it out of pocket. I'm sure your insurance right. company is not going to pay for it. Yep. Um, and as for why men are not tested, there's no test that's approved, right? That's basically it. I was I looked this up particularly, and it says no test for men, HPV test for men has been approved. Now, why not? I don't know. Well, one of the things is that in women, you are uh, you know where to look and what to look for. Okay, because uh, in a in a, uh, a healthcare system in a developed country, women are regularly getting. Uh, uh, examinations, including pap tests, mm. so that you can look for uh, pathology that would be associated with HPV. You know how to sample it. It's not like it's a blood test or anything like that. You're looking at a specific site for a specific problem. Right. In males, although these viruses cause uh, certain kinds, can cause certain kinds of cancers, they're actually quite rare. Um, and they're also pretty obvious when they show up. And beyond that, you don't know where to look or when or what to look for, really. Yeah, so and there's also, there's also an inverse correlation um, in effectiveness in men based on coverage rates of the vaccine in women in the same population. So if you, if you build a model of this where uh, female vaccination coverage is very low, then vaccinating males becomes more cost effective Mm. but if female vaccination coverage is high then male vaccination becomes much less cost effective because they're much less likely to be exposed to it so basically rich what you're saying is in women we can sample a very specific area the cervix we take some cells and we look at those right right in men the cancers are penile and, and genital and so that's a bigger target and you just can't sample every year, right? Right, because there's too much area to sample. Right, the cervix right. is very uh, circum is very limited. But if a guy develops a wart in one of those two, then it's done. There's no point in screening anymore. Right. Uh, right, and and it's gonna and it's probably it's gonna be pretty obvious. Yeah. The other thing is that the other thing is that um, 
there's only a very, very small percentage of even the high-risk HPV infections that wind up going on to cancer. So if you go sample the population uh, by some random test, you're going to find that uh, somewhere, well, you're going to find that upwards of 90% of, no, uh, over 50%, maybe 75% of the population has uh, HPV of some sort or another, and a very large percentage of them are going to have some of the high-risk uh, HPVs, um, but that doesn't really mean anything, okay, because there's only a very, very small percentage of those uh, that uh, pr uh, progress to some kind of cancer. So it, even if you did the sampling and got the results, you wouldn't know what to do with them. You wouldn't know how to interpret them. Now, what we do is we immunize kids, basically. Yep. Right, and I want to say, even though it's a small percentage, as you say, it's still thousands of deaths from cervical cancer, which we want to prevent. That's why, right. oh yeah, you want to get Absolutely. the vaccine. But boys and girls get the vaccine, and you hopefully will eventually cut down significantly transmission. Right, and although the correlation with other types of cancer uh, isn't uh, is that it's a correlation as opposed to proof that we know for cervical cancer, oropharyngeal cancer is. Uh, pretty prevalent in males and that that is caused probably caused by HPV is pretty high number right. yes mm -hmm. which has only shown up in the statistics at all because of declining smoking rates by the way hmm. um, so there's there was a little bit of press about this a few years ago um, that you know men are getting throat cancer yada 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 um, but actually those rates were always there it was just drowned out by the number of men who were getting throat cancer from smoking cigarettes right. exactly yep so now that we're not going to get that way, now you're yeah. finding the cases that are caused by HPV. So you make a really important point, uh, Vincent, and, and that is that even though I said that the, the incidence amongst high-risk HPV infections of progressing the cancer is small, still on a population scale, if you don't do anything about it, the number of cases of cervical carcinoma is going to be fairly large. And yes. one of the important things, most important things about this is that in the current society, nobody has to die of this disease, okay? Right. Not only are there treatments from early diagnosis, but also there's a vaccine available. You put those two things together in a conscientious healthcare system, and nobody has to die of this disease. That's right. Now, now um, Brian also asked, if you've got one of the serotypes, would it be still worth getting the vaccine for the others? I don't know, but I would guess yes, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. So, but you'd have to be young enough. If you're 40 and you have a serotype, then it's too late anyway, right? Or is it uh, not? If you know, yes. You and a, a, an important thing about the vaccines is that once you've been infected, it's too late. The vaccines won't regress right. Right. Uh, an right. infection or cure an infection or anything like that. And the, the tests are done how? Are they PCR based tests or serology? Uh, they're PCR. The serology, uh, the the serological response is um, not a hundred percent. Not right. a, not everybody. The right. the the infection is in cells that are uh, pretty much sheltered from the immune system, and so not everybody gets uh, an antibody uh, response. Uh, typically, what's typically what's done for cervical carcinoma, and it can be done for the other uh, cancers when they show up as well, is to take a, and for cervical carcinoma, you do a pap smear, and the first thing you do is look for uh, abnormal cells of a certain type. They're called uh, coelocytes, mm -hmm. and it's basically a, it's basically a, an HPV a cytopathic effect that you can see on a stained slide, and if you uh, see that, I, I don't I think you have to take another sample. I don't know if you should be able to do it on the same sample, but I'm not sure. There's a PCR-based test that will tell you whether or not you have HPV, and that's a virtual certainty. The uh, virtual, Virtually all such cervical abnormalities are uh, HPV-associated, but it can discriminate whether you have a high or low-risk uh, type HPV infection, and that uh, impacts on how you're going to deal with the uh, how you're going to treat the condition. Okay, that should do it, Brian. Okay. 
Uh, let's do some picks because Dixon's falling asleep here. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, he's not. You're falling. You don't like this HPV discussion. Not, it's no, a shame I, because no. it's very important. I'm just making room for Richard. I, I love it when he waxes philosophical. <laughs> well, it was not just philosophical, though. But that's okay. Alan. I have a passion for this. My, uh, you do. You do. My, my um, sister-in-law died of a cervical carcinoma at the age of 34. Oh, gee. Oh, uh, that is my wife's sister. Mm. Uh, and when I lecture to the medical students, lectured, I guess, past tense, though I may continue to do this one, uh, I always try to include a clinical case to get their attention and make it relevant to start off with. And I lectured on HPV to the medical students at UF for over 20 years go of 25 or so and uh kath my sister-in-law was my clinical case for that lecture dixon what famous woman in the 50s died of an hpv induced cervical tumor i'll give you a hint henrietta lux <laughs> <laughs> yes is that true yeah, she, yes. had, she had HPV, clearly, because when we see when the genome of okay. HP, okay. The HeLa cells was sequenced, there was HPV integrated into the genome. Wow. HPV 18? 18, right? Wow. I think nearby some uh, oncogenes, maybe. Mm. Anyway, yes. Mm. Every HeLa cell has got <coughs> HPV DNA in them. All right, picks of the week. Alan Dove, what do you have? I have uh, a NASA site where you can drive the Mars Curiosity rover around. Nice. <laughs> not for real, not for real, of course. You, uh, <laughs> but you can, it's a very nicely done uh, uh, virtual reality type of animation. If you do this in full screen uh, and you click and drag on the screen, you can drag the screen around. Uh, you can drag the view around and look at it from above or the side or what have you. Lovely. Um, and you can point to different places that it's been on the Martian surface and, and watch it reenact its trip there and what it did. Right. I've been trying to run this, and I get a thing that says in my Chrome browser that says rats, WebGL hit a snag. Oh, dear. Get a Mac. And apparently WebGL, yeah, I know. <laughs> apparently WebGL is okay. This must be a Windows 10 thing or something. Oh, it's so cool. Anyway. Firefox on the back, it works works beautifully. Can I drive it okay. off a cliff, uh, Alan? You could. It'll, it'll only let you do <laughs> stuff. It's programmed to reenact certain things. You can take control of it. The One of those options in the tabs over to the left, you can move parts of it around. Is it really this slow? It, it And they're showing you, when they show those animations, it, is, it says like 60x speed. Oh my gosh, it's now digging. Oh, interesting. It moves yeah. really, really slowly because... You know, it, battery power is at a premium, and there's True. no hurry. It's not like it's going to hit traffic. Right. Yeah. Um, this is so cool. Nice. But it, uh, it's a very cool site to play with. Thank you. Lovely. Rich Condit, what do you have? So I don't know if this is really a pick or just a shout-out <laughs> to uh, a preschool here in Austin, Texas. It's, a, 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 I guess, a chain of preschools. They're called the Primrose Schools. And uh, this is where my four-year-old uh, grandson uh, spends his days. And he came home one of the first days I was here uh, with a happy gram, <laughs> basically a note from his teacher <laughs> that says, this morning during free centers, because that's some sort of free time, Porter, that's my grandson, chose to play with our science materials. Mm -hmm. He was so curious with the magnets and was very excited when he discovered that he could move the magnets on top of the table by placing a magnet underneath the table. He was even showing off to his friends announcing, check out my magic trick, guys. Nice work, Porter. We love to see you exploring things on your own and having fun. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so I thought... Good for the school for having a science materials place. Good for the teacher for noticing. Good for Porter for messing around. And the teacher, you know, noticing what was happening here. The kid was curious yeah. and exploring his curiosity with this. And, you know, magnets are cool things. Yes. <laughs> Definitely an acorn so, dropping right next to the tree. Yeah, I thought that was fun. <laughs> 
So I, this is an interesting name. You know, Porter is the name of a, ra- a very nice beer, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Was he, was he named after a beer? <laughs> I do. That's so. so. great steak also. When he say. grows up, uh, <laughs> he's going to have people saying, hey, let's have a Porter. <laughs> That's cool. Kathy, what do you have? I picked a site which I think is a, a YouTube channel. And the reason that somebody sent it to me was because of the fact that that shows this really cool way that you can uh, prepare a watermelon so that it looks like you've just uh, barely cut into the rind of the watermelon and you open it up and there's the whole watermelon and it's really cool. But when I went to the site, it was uh, it led me to this video that the guy has done about five different ways that are the best ways that you can use if you have been challenged with the project of how do you drop an egg and keep it from breaking, a raw egg and keep it from breaking. And it's really cool. And he goes through the physics of it and the pros and cons of each of the kinds. And evidently, he had something to do with Mars rovers and landings <laughs> and things like that because he mentions that a couple times in the video. Yeah, he's an engineer who worked on the Curiosity for like yeah. nine years. Yeah, so it's a cool site. He puts up evidently a new video a month, and I haven't explored all of them, but I thought it was a pretty cool site, at least for the egg drop and the watermelon thing. <laughs> I watched this whole thing, and it was fantastic. Yeah. And the guy's really good. He's got over 70 million views on his site. Nice. It's really cool. That is incredible. It's really well done. Dixon, do you yes, have a pick? I do. It's called, uh, it's a book. It just recently came out from Yale University Press, entitled Dragonflies, Magnificent Creatures of Water, Air, and Land by Peter Van Dokum. And it's a great book because of several reasons. One is that it gives you amazing, beautiful, clear, crisp, up-close looks at a a first-class predator. I mean, when I was growing up in uh, the South, as a kid, I used to vacation back with my grandparents in New Orleans and catch them. Uh, we call them mosquito hawks because that's what they were eating. <laughs> so had I known that, I would have let them all go. Um, their larvae that live in uh, fresh water can eat minnows and, and small wow. fish. So, so they're absolute voracious predators. And yet they're so beautiful and graceful. And there have been lots of Scientific American articles on how their wings work and all that stuff. So I've always been fascinated with them. And there are millions of species, not quite, but you know, it seems like a lot of species. They're faster than blazes, and yet they can navigate their way through you know, grass and swamps and stuff like this looking for things to eat. So I, I, I love the pictures, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm a picture kind of guy. This looks cool. Yeah. We, we were, um, a couple of months ago, we were up camping uh, at a place, uh, actually the same place we went Labor Day weekend up near Athol. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the campsite is right, the uh, campground is right on a lake, oh, yeah. an artificial lake. Yeah. And when we were there earlier in the summer, um, we spent, uh, my wife and my daughter and I spent about, oh, I don't know, two hours completely mesmerized by watching the dragonfly nymphs coming out of the water yes. and molting and yes. and popping their wings out yes. and taking off. Wow. It was just a, an amazing, my wife saw it, she, she was just yeah. sitting yeah. down by the water, she said, oh my yeah. gosh, look yeah. at this. Yeah. And it was really cool. I do a lot of trout fishing, and on the Delaware River one day, I recall this day distinctly, because like it seems as though there's a quorum-sensing molecule that all of them... They all do at the same time, They come out as cohorts. They don't just come out one at a time. The whole bunch of them hatches all at once. So if you're a a predator of dragonflies, you can only eat so many of them and so many more to escape that. What a nice strategy, but it's fascinating to watch. You're absolutely right. It's just amazing. So, you know, that was my pick. How was the camping, Alan? Great? It was pretty good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it was good. So, by the way, we're talking, we call artificial lakes reservoirs, Alan. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This one, this one no longer functions as a reservoir. It's a, well, I think it, I'm not sure it ever did. It was, um, it's mainly a flood control. Got it. Um, lake. Mm. All right, my pick is a uh, post on a site called lovethegarden.com, which refers to a NASA study done a long time ago, 25 mm. years ago, all about air filtering houseplants. Oh. I thought I would pick this because, you know, people think I hate plants. <laughs> Especially and, and you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. I actually, I don't even like houseplants. But <laughs> uh, this is a report 
uh, which shows that some plants can filter out uh, some of the chemicals produced in buildings, the built environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, trichloroethylene, benzene, formaldehyde, xylene, etc. The florist's mum is the most effective hmm. next to peace lily. They're very good at filtering out these things. Hmm. And uh, so you can check it out and decide what plant you would like to put in your house to uh, suck up all this nasty stuff <laughs> from the built environment. Personally, I think plants kind of mess up the built environment. The yeah, look, no. the look yeah. of the wood and the marble and the steel, I really like that. And the uh-huh. plants, you got to water them and so uh-huh. forth. Eh, you know, I'm not a big fan of house plants. You know, when I was a grad student, I had house plants and they all died. Really? <laughs> Probably, since, uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> probably yeah, them. You they hated them. They're not I hate all, you. They're not Die, all you darlings. <laughs> so this is, you know, they died. I didn't water them. I just sprayed them. Oh, I figured that would be, I was an idiot. I, <laughs> so they died and I said, to me, my And you went to died. Cornell? Like, no, I wasn't a grad student at Cornell, no. Okay. But I did go to Cornell as an undergrad, but I didn't take any plant courses up there. I had a lot of plants in my apartment. They all died. I threw it all out. I said, that's it. Fortunately, my house currently does have house plants but i do not take care of them good thing um, they just multiply you know uh, my wife has african violets and every time a leaf drops off she starts a new plant oh. so we have like 50 pots what, what am wow. i why do i need 50 pots of african violets around what, i just don't looks understand to me like looks to me like if you have peace lilies and florist chrysanthemums <laughs> you're gonna live forever because right. they'll yeah. suck up all the obnoxious exactly. stuff you're in. Exactly. Yeah. especially anyway, in new jersey <laughs> i'm somewhat joking but um it's, it's an interesting article so it's cool they can did you know that dixon they can pick up in, some chemicals. of course i knew that all right we have a listener pick from amir who writes i was recently invited to george to join publons to get credit for peer review and referred to an article in nature for more information Below are the links. I thought it could be a weekly pick. Uh, so Publons is a site where you register and you get credit for doing peer review. Uh, huh. And um, nature, the Nature article is a kind of an explanation of this whole thing here. Mm-hmm. So, um, what the, uh, I, I don't quite understand what credit means in this case. Uh, it's is not, there it's, money in this? No, you don't get money. You don't, you no. just get a number. It says you've done this number of reviews for these journals, and mm. they probably have lists of the people who do a lot of reviews and so forth. Yeah, so and the, interesting. There's a connection uh, when you do them now for ASM. You can have it automatically track the ASM ones, and that's probably true for other journals that you might review for. But I'm a little bit with Rich. I mean. I did whatever it is to sign up, and then they keep bugging me. I, I, have, I haven't gone further with it because, you know, wh- how, why would you want to report this? Well, I can report it on my annual report, and the chairman sees that. And, you know, if you inflated it, I, I mean, I guess this is proof, and so that proof against, you know, making stuff up, but it's not going to be a major factor in promotions or pay raises or stuff like that. So this, I, I, I'm not sure I get it. This seems about as useful as accumulating likes on Facebook. Well, for, 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 for Twiv, it's they, good because we get more listeners, you know. On, they, on say it was, they say it was funded with a $300,000 grant from angel investors in New Zealand. Okay? Really? Mm. What what? Uh, what are they expecting to get out of this? Well, they're probably going to use advertising to make money. I, I suppose, guess, you know. just so, on Facebook. <laughs> so I have this feeling that you know maybe I'm missing something, um, but I, you know there there's probably some population for which this is a useful thing, but I I'm missing the importance. I mean, I can only assume the business model is to get a lot of researchers into this and and doing it, and then mine the data somehow and and sell the data to marketers, but I don't know what those would be useful for. It says but they I, have uh, 44,000 people signed up here. I don't know if that's... that's nice. I don't know how much that is, what that represents, but I, don't, I wouldn't do it because... I you should do it too much and already. Well, I, I don't know I, what good it's going to do. I thought bottled water was a stupid idea, too. Yeah. I still do. But, uh, <laughs> it is. It is. You're correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think if this could help open access to all the journal articles, that would be great, but it's not. <laughs> no. I don't see how it would do that. No. <laughs> it's not going to have anything to do with it. No. So, Speaking right. of bottled water, I th- what is the statistic? I just heard it takes like six liters 
of water to make every liter of bottled water. Or something <laughs> ridiculous like that. You know, I understand, but Rich and Alan, I see people walking around drinking water who never drank any water before there was a bottle of water. So yeah. I think it's good that people drink a lot of water, right? Right. We, we know the health benefits of that. So, I mean, what's bad with, with having people drink well, water more? There are health benefits to be... There are health benefits to being properly hydrated. I don't know that any health benefits have been demonstrated for just drinking a lot of water. Hey, too much doesn't help, but too some, much people, doesn't help. some people would not drink any water all day, and now they're walking around with a bottle and drinking it. Now, and you could take a, a refillable container and do the same yeah, thing. Sure. A lot that of people I'm good with. Container, yeah, I'm that's fine. With that. That's better. And if this stimulated that behavior because people said, well, I'm not paying four bucks for a bottle of water, that's good. Right, um, right. So I wonder if... If the company stopped making bottled water, would a lot of people then use a refillable container because they got used to the habit of drinking? I'll bet they would. In fact, you see a lot of that going on. A lot of people don't trust the community, the municipal water supplies. You Mm -hmm. know, they have prejudice against them, and so therefore they love bottled water. But do they really know where the bottled water comes from? (laughs) Right. The bottled water is is actually regulated less stringently than the community water supply in this country. That's right. Now, if if I'm overseas somewhere where the where the tap water is not um i'm not sure if the tap water is safe to drink then i will drink yeah. bottled yeah. water yeah. but yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. a totally different story yeah. it's a proof again subject. that we will go anywhere on twiv here we are <laughs> 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 exactly hey we're talking about microbes no? yeah. right. Oh, okay. all are. right this is twiv you know we uh, <laughs> we have right. an unprejudiced view of everything exactly <laughs> Twiv is at twiv.tv. It's on iTunes. It's on your favorite podcatcher, whether that be on iOS or Android. So do subscribe. It's free. And uh, learn all about the cool world of viruses. If you have questions or comments, please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com and urbanag.ws. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, and it stopped raining, so the picnic may be good. All right. Yes. Excellent. How far away do you have to go for this picnic? Oh, half a mile. Yeah, well, you know what's going to happen, don't you, Kathy? Ants. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it in a park? Yeah. All right, have With fun. With a shelter. Have fun. So, yeah. Thanks. Rich Condit is a emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville. He's right now in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, this is a gas. What is your next stop? Are you going home? Going home. This week? Miro, probably. We'll probably leave on Monday. I expect we'll be home Tuesday evening. That's wow. my guess. And now we will is, have been gone yeah. ten and a half weeks, I think. Uh, is that right? Uh, let me see. We left the 3rd of July. July, August, September. Yeah, like ten and a half weeks. Wow. We just turned over, the other day, we just turned over 10,000 miles in the car. 417 uh, gallons of gasoline. Oh, that's great. Great trip. Uh, do you? <laughs> are you feeling more relaxed? Uh, yes. This is this trip has been just awesome. <laughs> we've seen we've seen everybody from both sides of the family, and we spent Ibby and I spent a week on the Colorado Plateau. Nice. Uh, starting from uh, we did geologic time, and then we did uh, anthropologic. I mean, we did uh, Zion, Bryce. Nice. Arches, nice. <laughs> Canyonlands, Mesa Verde, and then yeah. spent a couple of days in Santa Fe. It was amazing, just amazing. Right. So we've had a great time, and it's been a wonderful sort of transition buffer into this uh, new life. What kind of car I don't are you know driving? What, uh, it is a uh, 2013 Ford Edge, sort of a semi SUV. Yeah. And it's done marvelously. It's a very, very nice, nice car. I love nice, it. Nice, nice, nice. So you did pretty well at joining us on Twiv, so thanks for that. We appreciate oh, it. Oh I, I you know, it's this is great. <laughs> I mean it's great. You know, I do everything I can to stay with this because it's wonderful. Thank you. We appreciate You're it. Well. So from now on you don't have any more reasons to miss it because you'll be home, right? Uh, well, for a while, <laughs> till the next trip. What are you going to take another trip right. in like six months? Well, we're coming. We're coming back here in uh, November because my granddaughter got a uh, a role in one of my daughter's uh, plays uh, at Texas State. Ah, cool. She's gonna. She's got a solo singing role in Evita. 
Okay, oh, this is wow. just going to be awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Sarah gets to light the show. It's just going to be awesome. So we'll stay here for Thanksgiving. Are you then we'll go to Oregon. You going to uh, Probably. Yeah. Probably. Then we'll go to Oregon again for Christmas. This is the life. <laughs> this is it. See life, what you've been missing? <laughs> life of an emeritus professor, right? That's there right. you go. Good. But I'll take my have headset. We'll travel. <laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And I am Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. All right, we have some titles here. You know, I really like <laughs> the cats from Pen D. There's something, there's something, something about that. That uh, you know, the, the, I mean, they're all good. Feline, a little ill. Give me a break. This is <laughs> exact. I think I the, like cat got your T cell. Yeah. Cat yeah. Cat. I like the cat in the heart. But yeah, <laughs> they're all good. Yeah, I don't know they're which one. Good. Dixon, you have any preferences? All of them. Let's take them all this time. You know, we could let Alan choose. Yeah, Alan, which do you like? I maybe either Cat Got Your T Cell or Cat in the Heart. Um, okay, I, I live right outside of Springfield. I have to go for the Cat in the Heart. Is that where he's from? <laughs> that was where that was where Ted Giesel was. Yes. Okay. In fact, right. we have the Seuss Museum here in Springfield.